Well, now it is uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Martin Bohus, um, who is, uh, well, actually, it's interesting because I think probably some of you, I'm, I'm sure all of you are familiar with, with his work, but many of you maybe never have seen Martin before. But Martin is uh, really an icon in uh, BPD research and treatment development and treatment delivery uh, in the world. He runs uh, a fantastic lab and has for, what, 20 years or something like that, a long time, uh, which is very unique in the sense that he's looking at very basic processes, psychophysiological processes, physiological processes, as well as psychotherapy processes. He's the first, if I'm right about this, I think he's the first chair uh, who's a behavior therapist in Germany. All previous chairs uh, in psychiatry have been psychoanalysts. So that's uh, quite an accomplishment, and I'm sure we can only imagine uh, what that might be like. So anyway, he is the chair of psychosomatic medicine and psychotherapy at the University of Heidelberg and the director uh, of the Clinic of Psychosomatic Medicine at the Central Institute of Mental Health, which in Germany is the parallel to our National Institute of Mental Health. So he's. Uh, running the show there, and uh, he and his colleagues have really prov provided us with some of the most interesting, provocative, and innovative uh, methods and uh, data uh, around for BPD. So it's really a pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Martin Bokus. Okay, thank you, Alan. Good morning, I highly appreciate you getting up that early. On Sundays, for me it's better. I'm mid to the afternoon or something like that. <laughs> so uh, my topic is to present data, ideas, and a little bit techniques how we do. Uh, if we apply DBT to patients suffering from PTSD after childhood sexual abuse, um, Whenever, and this is a strong school of Marshalls, whenever you start to develop a new treatment, the first question you have to ask yourself is that really needed. And um, since treatment developing on the one thing is really challenging, but on the other thing it's a much of fun, and for, for a lot of young, enthusiastic, ambitious people, they go for and say, okay, I developed my new treatment. This is, I can do workshops and make a little bit of money and stuff like that. But what's currently running is, uh, is that we are totally overwhelmed with uh, new treatments every month. And I think it's some kind of uh, responsibility to the field to really focus on that what's needed. So if you look at childhood sexual abuse, I think most of you are aware that it affects around about 10% of the females and 6% of the male population. This is more or less the, the data if you look at the whole meta-analysis. 10 up to 12 percent. And um, if you look at the sequela uh, from childhood, of childhood sexual abuse, everybody of you would say, okay, it's PTSD, but that's wrong. Uh, it's intuitive, but it's not the only and it's not the most <laughs> often sequel. So more general are anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, eating disorders, substance abuse, PDBS is clear, uh, then uh, PTSD, so that's German, sorry. Then sleep disorder is the most common problem. Uh, suicide attempts more around double as often as, as PDBS, uh, PTSD, then BPD. Uh, and then if you look a, a little bit more on the sub-threshold uh, features, then you send a lot of dissociative features, low self-esteem, and what's important, somatic disorders. There are recent data that uh, cardiac pro problems and so are strongly related to uh, childhood sexual abuse and this may be due to the HPA axis and uh, this may be due to metallization problems and stuff like that, but uh, this is an ongoing new research field and I think we, we didn't have it, had it in the scope as long since we only focused on psychiatric problems. And if you look at all that, you can say, okay, this is a bunch of uh, axis one and two disorders, but usually it's more or less arranged like this. So most of those have more or less the same uh, 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 patterns of this. It's, this means those who have PTSD also suffer from eating disorders, a little bit substance abuse, suicide attempts, sleep disorders, anxiety disorders, depression, and so on. So if you only look at one of, of those uh, uh, 
um, axis one disorders, you miss the field. And uh, if we look at the vice versa, the other way around, you, you see that PPD plays a role here. And we look at our borderline patients. And this is what Melanie Harnt will do in the next presentation details. And then you can estimate uh, that the prevalence of PTSD in our PPD sample is in our in treatment seeking patients in Germany, what is in patients is a little bit different than in the States. We have a very good, uh, let's say, residential treatment uh, possibilities. So it's not like emergency wards, but only, but we have a whole field of uh, what we call centers of excellence there, and people can go there, and insurance pays for let's say three, three, up to three to four months for these residential treatments. Yeah? Uh, we have get good data that it take, that is worth to do that, so for that, um, you take it in, in, in mind, it's always complicated to report about this in the States since they don't, can ima can't imagine that that happened. But anyway, the Cornell, I learned my treatment at Cornell. Uh, and there was the very first DPT unit there, and those times when I learned this was 1996, uh, they also had the possibility to, to treat for three months. And the Kernberg unit, also in Cornell, they had an average inpatient time of said, nine months or something like that. Uh, so in the outpatient samples, it's in the States more or less the same, let's say 60% more or less. Yeah? Um, in the community sample, not treatment-seeking uh, patients, it runs about 35%. So those who are interested for us, where you say, okay, we are... Uh, confronted with th those problems, let's say 50 to 60 percent of our patients suffer from uh, co-occurring co PTSD. This takes no wonder. If you look at our data, we have a, um, a quite large sample now um, of borderline patients which consecutively have been diagnosed and uh, very carefully uh, investigated with biographic interviews. Uh, this is a a representative sample of 285 patients and about 60% of those report sexual abuse during childhood, um, 39, let's say 40% physical abuse, and then with, um, uh, been witnessing violence between the parents about 35%. And as you see, uh, those who are uh, uh, victims of, of, social, uh, of sexual abuse, most of them are also have problems with physical abuse and um, witnessing uh, parental violence. This means this is not an exclusive problem, but it's an, the whole system is, is unpredictable and uh, a lot of violence in that. But as it's important, we are talking here in the family environment, 24% don't report one of those major three problems. So you, it's, it, you simply cannot say that uh, BPD is the consequence of, of uh, let's say, uh, of complex PTSD or something like that. That's wrong, simply wrong. Data don't support that. But on the other hand, 60% have the problem. And if you look at the established psychosocial treatments, there are five meta-analyses on the uh, psychosocial treatments on childhood sexual abuse, and the, most, the best one is uh, recently published by Taylor and Harvey in 2010. Uh, the average effect size is around 0.7, which is about the half of the effect size of Bradley's meta-analysis, which showed that if you look at every PTSD treatment, including uh, the, what we call tra uh, type 1 trauma, this means accidents or, or war traumas or something like that. That's much easier to treat. You have effect sizes of about 1.4 in the average. And um, so we have only five, and we have only six RCTs. And um, those six RCTs are mainly focusing on two treatments. <laughs> so this means we have, okay. And if you look in details on the six RCTs, then the first has been published in 1997. This is Kills Group. And I listed up. Um, do we have some, some kind of a pointer or so? That would help a bit. Um, the exclusion criteria. So Slavnik et al., who was the very first, she excluded everybody who had some kind of substance abuse and severe dissociation. And uh, 
The only thing she did, she did uh, not intend to treat, but complete analysis is what they did in those times, and the effect size is but in 0.7. The first study by Cloydre, she excluded eating disorders, substance abuse, severe dissociation, borderlines, suicide attempts in the history. Uh, the median caps, caps is the, the, the measurement is 69. I reported since ours is much higher afterwards. Thank you very much. And also complete analysis with quite a nice effect size, but she included half of the population. And uh, Ch Chart, who, had, uh, who used Patty Resnick's cognitive processing therapy, she excused substance abuse, suicidality, and had a medium cups. Nice effect size. McDonough had, um, it is an exposure-based treatment plus problem solving, any suicide attempt in the history, any substance abuse, Exclusion. Resic also excluded in her cognitive processing therapy um, suicidality, I think, within the last year. And the only exception is Cloydre, who, who did not exclude borderline patients. She had about 25%, but she did not report data on this group. So we are not sure whether this group does better or not, so nobody knows what happens with that group. So that's the point. So uh, this means if you look at that group and you say, okay, if you're only focusing on PTSD and ex excluding the rest, you miss the game. And this is what currently has been done. So this is the situation where you're sitting there, okay, this is our, our client and our can be defined. So if we are focusing on the, on, on the group, we, this means PTSD plus severe emotional dysregulation plus dysfunctional behaviors to cope with this severe, uh, uh, severe emotional dysregulation, which, which is eating disorders, substance abuse, uh, CD, and so on. There is currently no efficient treatment. And so what we really do need is a treatment that is focusing on the one hand on traumatic experience and the other hand is including or not excluding highly dissociative features, suicidality, self-harm, substance abuse, eating disorders, and which can treat people or patients with a, with a symptomatology which is rather high. We looked at our borderline patients with the comorbid PTSD and the average was a cast of 90. And we... I, the, any other treatment currently published it lies about 60. So this means, yeah? CAPS is the clinically administered administ PTSD scale. This is the, the standard observer rated uh, instrument to assess the frequency and intensity, intensity of symptoms regarded to the related to PTSD. This is the standard. It's like the PDI or, or something in depression. So this is where, PT, uh, where DBT comes in, 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 the, in the field, in the game, and said, okay, why not to use simply DBT? And um, this is data from Melanie Horn. I'm sure she will report afterwards in more detail. This is just to give the first thing. Is she published a very nice, published in the Journal of Consulting and, um, and JCC, where she looked at the remission rates in DBT on PTSD if you don't target PTSD. This does not mean, okay, this is what Marsha... Uh, telling every time is that DBT treats on every be good behavioral cognitive treatment is more or less effective in those items which is targeting. And DBT, if DBT does not target PTSD, um, we have remission rates um, within the first year of treatment around 13% uh, in PTSD. This is not sufficient. Um, okay, so if we now Look, what we do need, then we have, the first problem is that, st uh, that the standard PTSD treatments, we were, went very detailed into the, all these manuals, and mainly what they're focusing is fear and threat. Maybe you're familiar, familiar with Edna Foa's exposure-based therapy. She only had the whole theory is based on the fear and threat uh, network, and nobody's focusing on emotions like guilt, shame, disgust, self-contempt. This is where DBT comes into the play. Since DBT 
definitely includes uh, and focuses uh, dysfunctional emotion or non-justified emotions or emotion regulation if you have problem, problems with guilt, shame, disgust, self-contempt. So the first challenge is that we have to focus these, uh, these emotions and we need protocols where we, how to focus them and when to focus them. The second problem, standard PTSD treatment, show is how to handle intense tensions and severe dissociative symptoms. These are data from our labs, and uh, Uli Ebner Prima, who has also been in Seattle sometimes, cooperating with Marshall's lab here, uh, has done the work. This, this is an assessment on the daily life conditions. So we gave them small, little, tiny mon uh, computer, handheld computers that beep, let's say, every 20 minutes or every five minutes, whatever you say them, and ask, please tell me how strong is your distress currently. We call it aversive tension, since this describes very correctly what patients are feeling. And then they can rate, rate between, uh, on a scale between 0 and 10, and they anchor it at 7. 7 means that um, this aversive distress is so strong that you cannot think on anything else but stopping it. And you start to dissociate some. And here, what you, what you see is, this is the, oh yes, okay, this is not the, dis, sorry, sorry, sorry. Here you see the correlation between the distress and the dissociative features. So that means we ask them, in addition to the level of stress, do you feel right? Do you, uh, do you uh, percept pain? Do you, uh, ha do you have optical problems? Do you have acoustic problems? Do you feel like being in your body or being outside of your body? Do you have the feeling that the time is running fo forward or is standing still? Stuff like that. So these are quite operationalized fe uh, features from the dissociative symptom scale. And what we see here is the red line is that we have a very strong 0.9 correlation between the level of distress and the dissoci dissociative symptoms. This is in borderline patients, and this is, you also have the same thing in, in major depression, but they never experience more, uh, stronger arousal or stronger distress than on this scale uh, up to four. And we don't know how it is in healthy controls. There we, we, you don't get any ethical commitment uh, to stress them that strong that they start to dissociate in healthy public. You cannot do that. You have to have life-threatening uh, experiments for them. So the point is, and that's important, every borderline patient, whenever, uh, we did a lot of single analysis, so we checked about, let's say, 97 patients, we plotted out 97 patients, not one of those patients did not experience dissociative features if they were stressed. So you can say, so what? What's the problem with dissociation? There were some hints that there was some negative correlation between treatment outcome and, and uh, the, the level of dissociation. So we thought maybe that dissociation might be a problem uh, interfering with what we call emotional learning. Since from the very basics as a psychotherapist, as a neurobiologically oriented psychotherapist, psychotherapy is nothing but emotional learning. And those variables inhibiting social learning inhibit psychotherapy progress. And for that, what we did is simple uh, conditioning experiments. And we took borderline patients and uh, uh, trained them or, or uh, confronted them in, during the learning phase with a little bit power, uh, with a, a little shock, and, uh, and this yellow uh, color picture, and then uh, they had to learn to differentiate between the yellow and the, and the bl blue one. The blue one was not uh, linked to uh, an electric shock. And what you see here is you can, you can take the skin conductance reduction and, and assess how, how quickly are they learning that there's a correlation between this danger signal and this picture. It's easy. Uh, and the good news is, this is the borderline patients are those, the violet group, and what we see, borderline patients learn as good as anybody else. That's the very good news. Uh, 
The blue ones are healthy controls. These are the borderline patients, and this is the, the, the level. Uh, the, 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 let's say the, the level how, how quickly they learn. Here's the problem: they don't learn anything, and those are borderline patients who dissociate during the experiment. And this has been replicated now three times. This means once you are dissociated during an experiment, you simply do not learn. And then we got into neuroimaging and did the same experiments. And what we see is that during dissociations, the amygdala are totally shot down. So this is a shot down of the amygdala, and it's a shot down of the hippocampus. The hippocampus is responsible for short-term memory storage. So during, if you strongly dissociate, neither your, your amygdala nor your hippocampus is, is, is working. That simply means there is nothing like emotion learning. There's good news for all our psychotherapists uh, who are not that good trained in that, with their patients. That means if you stress them, it doesn't make any difference what you talk with them. <laughs> so you can really talk bullshit. <laughs> they don't remember. But for all those of you who really say, okay, maybe it's worse <laughs> that they uh, remind what I'm talking with them and stuff and, and, and so on, it, it is better to help them to uh, cool down the dissociation and block it. So the challenge number two is how to block dissociation during exposure. And the one thing what we thought is that we had to moderate the classic exposure-based procedures a little bit to help them to stay in reality. And, this is, and the second is we have to teach them how to use strong and quick working <coughs> anti-dissociative skills. And the good news is it's easy to block it. Since dissociation can be blocked by strong sensory inputs. This means whenever something, and, and it it's equals uh, what kind of inputs? It can be pain, it pa can be some proper receptoric information from the, from the uh, the heels uh, from, from the feet. Uh, it can be optical information. This is what, where EMDR is playing with, uh, EMDR. And uh, it can also be noise, but it has to be very strong. And also awful taste. It has to be strong. And then the brain is reorienting in what we say external reality. And uh, the dissociation is more or less blocked. And amygdala should, uh, are activated again. So we have t tested that stuff back and forth in, in, uh, in neuroimaging, and that works. The third problem with standard PTSD treatments are confronted is, is how to handle dysfunctional behavior like severe self-harm, serious self-harm, suicide attempts, and so on, there is no protocol for this. If you look at Edna Force protocol, there's no idea for that. And even pediatric good data with cognitive processing therapy, there's not, not, a, not a protocol for how to do, what to do if patients get suicidal. So the challenge we have is the first thing what we have to see, how to define exclu inclusion criteria, when are patients ready for let's say exposure-based, uh, uh, adding exposure-based protocols to standard DBT. We didn't know that. And uh, if we do that, how to provide safe conditions? What can we do then? Um, it, is it enough if we teach stress tolerance skills? Is it enough if we pro provide clear rules and contingency management? Is it enough and sufficient if we really have a strong and good relationships? We didn't know that. And for that, we thought, okay, uh, I try to implement this new protocol under residential conditions. This is mainly for safety reasons. And um, the other thing is that we have quite good data on this DBT residential treatment. This is something you shouldn't do as a scientist. This is, I brought together all those um, DBT treatments, which reported on the SCL90. The SCL90 in Europe is the standard uh, instrument for um, the general psychiatric problems. 
Um, in the States, it is not that often used. But uh, in Europe, it's quite, uh, everybody uses it since you can compare uh, different treatments on that. So, and I took those, and be sure this is not one study. This is a little bit, it's, it's nothing more than an idea you get. So this is not very scientific based, yes? But if you look at the different treatments here, this is the time um, axis, and this is the SCL90. Let's say start with mentalization-based treatment. Most of you are familiar with that. Yeah? This is Anthony Bateman's treatment. This is, a, this is a day treatment. And he had this treatment for 18 months here. And you see, an SC, uh, he started with rather, rather sick, uh, severe patients. He has SCL90 2.5. It's very high. It's a self self-rated instrument, so you don't have troubles with uh, all these uh, radar, radars. And what you see, within the first 18 months, there's also almost nothing happening. And then they continue their treatment as an outpatient treatment, but they apply the same treatment in the group. They call it follow-up, but it's not true. They, they, it's an ongoing treatment. And then it's getting much better, and they really have good results within the next 18 months. This is the standard psychiatric care in Great Britain. So nothing happens within 36 months. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> okay, this is Anthony Bateman. Then, uh, this is the Toronto group here. This is DBT versus standard psychiatric care, what they call, actually, it's a very good protocol, according to Gunderson, provided by specialists in, 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 in the suicide treatment. And they're doing both, you see, they're coming down it within, eight, within 12 months, Here's, this is a 12-month treatment, from 2 to uh, around 1.2 here on the general psychopathology. This is Kernberg's treatment in Germany. Th this is TFP. So they start at 1.5 and nothing happens. I didn't invent it, that's the data they present. Uh, that one is DBT residential treatment. That means, and this is our waitlist control. We randomized against this. We controlled it against this randomized this waitlist here, and what you see is that we get it within four months, as a three months treatment, one month after discharge. We assessed after discharge, and we get down to 1.2 after three months of treatment, and it stays stable for at least 18 months. So. This is what you're currently doing. If you say, on the long run, you see all treatments are more or less equal, except of, uh, of, of TFP. Uh, but it, I think it counts whether it takes you three years or three months to get the same results. Uh, and for that, as I say, okay, it's at least, it was a long start. It says a lot of people thought residential treatment is harmful for borderline patients. You cannot do this. They learn how to cut themselves and re they reinforce them. Uh, for dysfunctional behavior and so on. But the fact is that it's really a very sufficient and, and, and highly effective treatment, and it's, it's rather quickly working. So for that, as I say, okay, it's not non-ethical. Non uh, if I, uh, if, if I uh, construct this or design this, this uh, new, new applications under residential conditions. The advantage there is that you, we have a highly trained staff, we have secure conditions, and for that, we can take patients even when they are cutting themselves. So we were not on that level that we said, okay, they have to get rid of cutting, but we said, okay, it doesn't matter. You can cut yourself. Come in. We work anyways. And uh, the only re prerequisite we said is that we don't want to have a life-threatening suicide attempt within the last four months. Life-threatening means really life-threatening, not intention, but really on the emergency room with, a, with a severe medical consequences. This is what we, what we said we want to have four months after the last incident of this severity. The rest we took. Um, the treatment is structured in, four, in three steps. We start with step one, with mainly uh, on the functional, functional analysis uh, on the major avoidance and escape mechanisms, I tell you in details. We're looking what is what kind of what is the, tra uh, the trauma we are focusing, and we pr pr teach them the, the the few most important skills they do need. This means this is not a six months skills training, but the, the, we have only three 
weeks where they have to learn the major skills they have to use for the exposure. And every patient, any patient, after this three weeks started with the exposure-based treatment. This was the rule. Uh, first, we didn't have that rule, and then we found that uh, we prolonged the interval uh, till we started up to the end. Then uh, we had this situation, it, it was a fixed time, 12 weeks, and often patients started at with week 11 or something like that. And then I said, no, 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 no. It maybe is up to us as therapists that we are afraid, that we don't dare, and there are thousands of, of, of reasons not to do it. And we said, okay, I want to really know uh, whether we can't, can't do it. And then we said, okay, week four, we start. Whatever happens. <laughs> And of course, in DBT, every rule is, the, is made to discuss the exceptions, but we didn't have one who wasn't ready for exposure after f four weeks. And um, then, this is what we call step two or phase two. Uh, we start with what we call moderated exposure. I explain it in details. Uh, discrimination training, daily safe monitored exposure, body therapy, and then we had, if requested, we had some uh, treatment uh, on nightmares. Step three is the last three weeks. We call it win back your life. There's a lot of training processes and a lot of things change. And this is, I learned that the, the major problem is not the trauma related memories or intrusions or flashbacks. The major problem is the chronicity. And the major problem is that they adapted their life in a circumstances where the whole surrounding, family, partner, job, they are used to, an, uh, to, to, that, to, to that severe uh, PTSD. And one, once you change what the, the, the client, the whole field is totally irritated. And uh, we had two dropouts in the whole thing, and this was due to the partners. The partners came in and said, I cannot stand it. Yeah? She changed that much. And uh, we had no chance to persuade him. So and this is what I had to learn, that this um, chronicity is a problem for itself. The pathways to treatment means, uh, here's the residential uh, program. Some of them had already had stage one treatment. It's hard to be a borderline patient and not to have DBT in Germany. So uh, since it's totally widespread. We have 30 units uh, of this kind of, uh, uh, we have de uh, designed in all over Germany. And patients go usually there and uh, we have troubles with our uh, good outpatient therapists, but we have a lot of these highly specialized units. And uh, about half of those never had DBT before. And then we had this severe behavioral dyscontrol interview based on the SAC developed by Marshall Linehan. This is an instrument where you can clearly operationalize the severity of dysfunctional behavior. And this is with what excluded the, the life-threatening su uh, uh, suicide attempts within the last four months. Okay, and then after these uh, three months of treatment, they went out wherever they came from. Okay. Uh, one. Okay. This is said what, what we told. Serious uh, su suicide attempt. Severe aggressive behavior. We said, okay, if they are so hostile that they cannot control and uh, are attacking and something uh, other people, we have to exclude. There was not not one in our study. We had to exclude with that. Uh, then ongoing sexual contact to perpetrators. That was an exclusion criteria. So if, if there's an ongoing sexual contact, not, not uh, social contact, most of them had social contact, but sexual contact, then we say we don't start with the exposure. We have to focus and solve this problem first. Since it's hard to learn your brain that this, uh, this, that this problem doesn't exist any longer if you go out and then the same happens again. If this is the case, then we send them to a standard DBT program. Okay, so the, the background, the idea from an emotional perspective is that we say, okay, those patients who are suffering from PTSD after, after childhood sexual abuse, they suffer from an emotional problem. And this is, is emotional-based theory, what we have. And what happens is that any kind of, of cue uh, is activating what we call a primary emotion. And then... It is strongly uh, uh, related and activating uh, in a conditioned manner 
uh, what we call the trauma associated network. This means memories, uh, rumors, uh, cognitions, physical and body perception, and so on. And these primary emotions are not longer able or uh, functioning as, as uh, to, to handle reality. Usually patients have learned to escape from this trauma-associated na na network very quickly. And they have learned to avoid, on the long run, almost any cue or most of the cues, which is really leading to a very restricted life. So that's, this is a part two. And what we have to, then we have to say, what are, what are primary emotions? These are emotions which are related to the trauma itself. This means those emotions who happened during the trauma. And this is helplessness. This is disgust, very important. This is anxiety, it's very seldom and very rarely anger, but sometimes it happens. It's often sexual arousal. It's often humiliation, threat, and confusion. This is quite important here. People don't talk about that, but there is conditioning that often, on the long run, their own adult sexual arousal is conditioned with the activation of trauma-related pictures and stuff like that. And the problem is that sometimes they increase their sexual arousal by triggering um, trauma-related pictures and they are totally ashamed of that. So we have to, to, to report that, we have to talk about that. It's physical and biological stuff. And uh, once you have to, if you are, they are educated, I think we have about 60% of the patients have troubles with this item. Since uh, it, you don't have, if you are familiar with, with childhood sexual abuse, this is not rape. Most of the time, it's, it's, it's an ongoing process and the, and the perpetrators are often very kindly and smooth and they work <laughs> on their objects, yeah? So they are not interested in, 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 in not all, yeah, and on, uh, on violence, but, and that's the problem. Uh, sexual arousal is one of the, yeah, of the items you have to address. And also, the feeling to be something special, yeah? This is what the parents, fathers say, okay, you're better than your sister, you're better than your mother, I prefer you, we are close, yeah? Close relationships and pride. And the problem is they, that they are in these familiar situations where they usually don't get this kind of, uh, of respect or closeness or soothing, but only under sexual conditions. And this means these, are, these emotions are activated during the trauma. And they can function as internal stimuli. So if we talk the pathways to health, is you have, we have to disconnect the, uh, the strong conditioning between primary emotion and trauma-associated network. So we have to rewin and regain these primary emotions to use it on the reality, to handle the reality. Since you can imagine if you take all those emotions, helplessness, disgust, anxiety, anger, sexual arousal, humiliation, threat, confusion, pride, and these emotions are no longer available for you as a human being. Since whenever they are activated, you switch to this, what you call this trauma-associated network, then half of the life is, is, is a horror for you, since you need those emotions for handling daily life. Okay? So, and the point is how we do it. Basic is we, we try, or we, we trust on uh, the data where we say, okay, uh, exposure-based treatments are superior to, to simple cognitive uh, um, strategies. So. But if you do it, you have to block escape behavior and you have to block the avoidance on the long run. And so you have to know what kind of escape behavior patients use. And there are different mechanisms and levels. The one is the behavioral level. Suicide attempts, Marshall had already talked about that yesterday. A suicide ideation, a suicide attempt is escape behavior from... Um, um, from what we hear in that case, trauma-associated uh, emotions, self-harm, high-risk behavior, drugs, alcohol, vomiting, promiscuity, washing and showering, about 20% have really clinically relevant OCD. So this is escape uh, mechanism on a behavioral level that's easy to target. 
more complicated to target are the cognitive escape strategies, yeah? the, like suicide ideations, uh, any kind of destruction, rumination, denial, minimizing. So these are the, 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 the cognitive strategies, and they are automatic. They're working like this. And patients have to be aware of that. They have to learn it, that, that, that they're doing that. And on an emotion level, a dissociative state, I think dissociation is not an emotion. It's some, some kind of, an, of a stuck state. Yeah? And you can also say, okay, this is some kind of, of, of escape behavior. And there are a le- lot of secondary emotions, what Alan Frisetti had yesterday reported on this term. So uh, anger and w- most important, guilt and shame. <coughs> guilt and shame can be, from an emotional theory, be described and seen as secondary emotions to escape from the awareness of helplessness, per, uh, for example. So guilt, shame, self-contempt, self-hate are secondary emotions which are activated as escape behaviors. Also, that is, automa- is, 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 uh, is running intrinsically and automatic, so pati- patients have to learn that, and they have to be aware of that, and they have to know how to handle this non-justified guilt and shame. So this is more than simple exposure. You really have to block it, and you have to teach them. <laughs> Principle is then, okay, we, what we teach the, the, the clients and say, listen, you have something like an over, over you are before starting the treatment you are shifting all the time between an avoiding state this means I, I don't want to think about it I, I avoid everything what is remembering me or giving me a cue and the overwhelming state yeah? and they are shifting back and forth and back and forth and what we say what we are going to reach is what we call an acceptance state and acceptance and that's important does mean that we want to transform the non-controllable uh, flooding uh, intrusions into controllable memories. That's the point. And the establishment of a memory means that I have to accept what had happened. And this is easy to say, but most of the clients come with some kind of a magic idea that they want to get rid of the trauma. They want to get rid of the biography. They want to get rid of this memory. They want to have some kind of magic psychotherapist who transcribes or, or something of that, what is, whatever he, he's doing. And the very point where we start is we are not magicians. What we can do is helping you, accepting you, your past, accepting you, any detail of the trauma, and to help you to accept the whole thing and then uh, this will become part of your self. The story we tell is always an example, the metaphor is always, if you, can you imagine a mother who has s- suffered or experienced the death of a child coming to a psychotherapist and said, please little psychotherapist, help me to forget this child. That will never happen. Why not? Instinctively, we know this is part of our life. It's a wound, it's a scar, it will never heal totally, but we learn how to live with it. And exactly this is how we, what we teach the, the, the clients and say you, can, you cannot run away from that. This is like this traumatic experience, it's part of your, part of your life. And for that, is mindfulness is, is helping you and giving you the backbone of, uh, for uh, for this experience. So DBT provides already everything you need for this, uh, for this, uh, for, for these clients, and you only have to arrange it a little bit and to, to ask what, 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 what will be applied when and, and, and when and under which conditions. The heart of the whole treatment is what we call moderated exposure, and we call moderated since it's a little bit different than prolonged exposure. Since we try to reach a balance, an activated balance between what we call trauma-associated primary emotions, this is prolonged exposure, and balance it with the activation of reality contact. This means, I I show you afterwards an example then, this means we try to push them as hard as possible into their trauma emotions, and then we take them back every, let's say, two minutes or something like that, and say, okay, listen, uh, 
What's the difference bet between then and now? What are you hearing here? What are you feeling here? Uh, what is, we ask simple for sensoric information. We, we work with little power uh, uh, stream, the power, yeah, uh, for vibrations. We use different body postures and stuff like that. So the point is that due to the fact that we know that they easily start to dissociate and we have learned from our neurobiological uh, investigations that strong sensoric input blocks these dissociative features. And, we, this is, and so we say, okay, maybe it helps if we induce and applicate the strong sensoric information during the exposure treatment. On a neurophysiological concept, you can say this is context-dependent uh, reuptake, yeah? <laughs> the reconsolidation. Context-dependent reconsolidation. This is the, the experimental level uh, underlying this technique. The whole pre program is designed in uh, groups and individual training. We have, uh, 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 they learn a lot about uh, on the psychoeducation. Then we have the skills training. Daily mindfulness, um, that's a big advantage on the, on the, in, the, in the residential groups. So we, we can really help them to train every day for, let's say, 20 minutes up to 30 minutes mindfulness. We have groups and we run them and everybody has to participate. So there's no escape or there's no talking about that. So everybody has to do it. Yeah, and the point with mindfulness is um, it starts working, let's say, if, it, if you do it on a daily way maybe after three or four weeks. And uh, they, there's no reason to believe that. <laughs> um, and uh, so um, I think, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that whether we have data, how many patients really practice mindfulness if we give them ordinary skills training under, you, you have data? So, but my experience was that, that it, it's better to give, it really to, to structure them that correctly and say you have every day in the morning from 7 to, uh, to 7.30 is mindfulness. And sports. <laughs> yeah, it's German, it's hard. <laughs> and then we have cognitive interventions and formal exposure. As facultative treatments, we have discrimination training uh, in, in case that they have a lot of really troubles with disgust and nightmare treatment. So, just to give you the data on that, what we've done now is we've conducted an RCT. Um, this is our three months treatment. The first assessment was as, as a discharge. The second assessment was six weeks after discharge. The fourth was six. Uh, uh, is here. The last one is, is uh, six months follow-up, and that one is the waiting list. The waiting list is a treatment as usual wait list. Everybody has been in treatment that those time. Thirty percent had been at inpatient wards and some, something like that. So this is what usually happens. It's a treatment as usual, but uh, this is for scientific reasons important. They knew that afterwards they can enter this treatment. Yeah? And this is also always a little bit um, some, uh, weakening the data. But on the other hand, for ethical reason, it was difficult to say, okay, you have to, to participate uh, and you have to run the study half a year and as a an, uh, reinforcer, you never are allowed to uh, visit or to, to join our program. This was simple, complicated to do that. For that, we decided to, uh, um, to, to use a wait list. We allocated 74 patients to the, tr uh, to the trial. The diagnosis is, oh yeah, that's important. Um, we had PTSD after childhood sexual abuse, only PTSD after childhood sexual abuse. So that was a clear uh, population. And then we said, okay, they have to have at least either minimum four criteria of BPD, or current substance abuse, or current major depression, or current, current eating, eating disorder. Why didn't we take only borderline patients? The point is that we really wanted to test whether borderline patients did better or not. And if we only take borderline patients in, we have no control and no variance. For that we said, okay, we also take patients who didn't, did not fulfill the full criteria. That gave us the opportunity to afterwards calculate whether borderline has any impact on treatment outcome. Got it? Okay. Only female. 
uh, we did not take people with a lifetime diagnosis of schizophrenia uh, into the study. We had treated now medicated schizophrenics with PTSD, no problem. If they are meds, it works. Um, okay. Interviews, that's standard. We skit and so on, and then the outcomes, the primary outcomes is the, the clinically administered PTSD scale and the, and the, and the, and the, and the self-rating, the PDS, and then secondary outcomes is, is the back, the sty the anxiety, the symptom checklist, SCL90, and the borderline symptom list, since we wanted to know what happens with the borderline symptoms if we only target um, the PTSD problems. So the sample, you see, they are quite old. In the average, they have been 36. At the average age at start of sexual abuse has been eight, seven to eight. So that was early. Uh, they had a medium CAPS total score here about 90. This is what, what I already reported. So this is about a triple higher than what usually is done. Uh, in the average, they had four axis one diagnosis here and only one access, uh, additional access two diagnosis, but four one. Uh, about half of the patients had more than four borderline criteria, so that was fine for our calculations. And the mean number of borderline criteria was 4.2. Patients flow, this is only for scientific, I think we have to, can, can skip it. Uh, we did intend to treat analysis, this means everybody who started get in. We had two, two people who dropped out the inpatient treatment. This was what I said due to the partner interventions. And these are the results. Uh, on the cups, this is the wait list. Nothing happens. This is the, the treatment group. The T2 is uh, at admission, sorry, at discharge. And this is six, six weeks and six months follow up. And what we find is, it, uh, is it, of course, it's, it's, it's a fine decrease. We have an, an effect size of about 1.3 between group effect size. But what you see here is, so these are highly significant results, that's fine, but they start at 90 and they come down to 60 about that. And 60 about that means this is there where other treatments start. Yeah? So that means they are not cured, but they're doing much better. Um, maybe that's, that's what we can reach within three months. And if you look at the sample of the subsample of those who have more than five borderline criteria, we see exactly the same data as in the total sample. So the point is there's no influence, no impact of whether you have the full-blown criteria or less. We did the same assessments, including the borderline symptom list, which is, which is a severity assessment and the number of DSM-4 criteria. Na na neither, none of those uh, data has any impact on the outcome. So we can be rather sure that the, some of the diagnosis per se, or the borderline symptomatology does not impact the, the, the outcome. So that's quite good information. Um, yeah, the next thing is for those Total. For those who are in the, in the research field on, on post-traumatic stress disorder, you have to be aware that most of the data are a little bit tricky, since most of the researchers report on what they call a CUPS index trauma. What is an index? Index is if you make a diagnosis and you say, okay, you had, let's say, an accident, yeah? And then they ask, do you have intrusions of that accident, do you avoid situations related to these accidents, and so on. And then they say, okay, you have a PTSD related to this accident. Okay? And then they treat this, and then they say, okay, it's done, it's going better, related to this accident. This means index. Yeah? And there's not one study in the whole literature which is reporting on the total, on the effect on the total uh, PTSD symptoms. This means, if I, and this is what you usually do, I'm taking out one trauma, let's say a rape at the age of nine, okay? And then I focus on it and I'm treating it and I'm successful. Then I can be totally successful and it's done, 
Then I have a total remission on PTSD, but the patient can have 10 additional problems. Yeah? And this is what, what, what you then have to do is you have to report the cups on the total, this heißt on, on the whole, on every single item. And this is usually not done in origin. It takes us two years to find this out. Uh, since that was not my major game before, before and I really, I never could check it. How, how did they get, get that perfect data? And they had effect sizes of 2.7 and I ne never found it. And then I started to think, okay, might be that they only report about one trauma. And then I called them and they said, of course we are reporting only about one trauma. Since we are sure that if you have one trauma, it's generalizing. And I asked them, do you have data on the generalization? They said, no, but that's sure, that's clinical wisdom. So this is how the, the game is played. Um, so the point is that I think what we have to do in future is to report A, index, and B, total. And this is what we're doing here. So we are talking here about the index, you see, and here's the total. It's a little bit weaker. So the effect size on total is 1.1, on, uh, on the index was 1.4. This means that those I've been calling are right. <laughs> it, it makes sense to focus on one uh, index trauma. It, there is some kind of generalization, and this is what also what I had was is my experience. Uh, I tell you a little bit afterwards. So, if you're looking at the PDS, it doesn't look that nice since uh, a PDS is let's say remissions are around one. Uh, we have the same data on the, on the self report, so we have significant group differences, and we have uh, and also there in the self reports no difference between the borderline patients and the non-borderline patients. If you look at the borderline symptom list, this is um, the, the severity of the borderline symptomatology. They start quite high. This is 2.3, uh, 2.2, uh, that's, that's, that's high. They go down to 1.5. Um, this is what we reach usually in our three months inpatient treatment. If we only focus on not PTSD, but borderlines, other stuff, yeah? That means focusing PTSD within this group of borderline patients reduces the classical borderline symptoms. This is like feeling like being alone, being, being different than others, suffering from isolation, uh, in, uh, suicidality, all these uh, different items. So, and you, you also see this is, this is this 2 point two says this is, our, this is the, uh, more or less the level of, of normal borderline patients we take for, for the residential treatment if you don't treat the, the PTSD. This means these are, are severe borderline patients. And if we look at the between group effect sizes on CUPS, this is the CUPS index. This is the full sample here. Uh, the green one is the group with more than five criteria. The red one is the group with, with less than five criteria. And you see there's absolutely no difference if you look at the effect sizes. <coughs> Interesting here, the trauma related, this is what Marsha says, what you're targeting, you get it. No? So we have strong effect sizes in the PTSD related symptomatology. We have weaker effect sizes here uh, in, uh, in, in, at the BDI and the STI and so on. Response and remission. And the response rate means a 30% reduction in the cups. We have about 60% response rate here uh, compared to the weightless here. And we have about a 36 uh, a remission rate in our uh, remission rate. This means no PTSD at all. This is not that good as we thought. But if we could look at the symptom severity at the beginning, then we have it here. This is the most recent study by Cloitre at all, this is where she starts at the, at the, with, the, with the cups at 30, 63, and of course, if you start very low, you get better uh, remission rates. This is where we start, and we get down here, and this is where she starts, and she gets down here. So maybe it's an, it's a, it's a, you have to, maybe uh, for sure, you have to continue the, the treatment. This is the back. Look at Cloitre's back, it's about 18. This is right, yeah? Our start is 38, and uh, so we get them down to 29. That's not that successful, but you see how severe they are. Safety issues, and that's important since we, we weren't sure whether what happens. If we really say, okay, we want to have everybody 
with any exception, after four weeks in the exposure treatment. And exposure means we're looking for the index trauma, and the index trauma is the most severe trauma they're currently memorying. This means we ask them, on your whole lifeline, what is the, the, what is the item where you're suffering the most? This means most flashbacks, you're avoiding any cues most, the heaviest nightmares. What is that what you don't want to talk at all, n not at all about? Yeah? This is what we call the index. And so we take that one. Since we are an inpatient ward, and that, okay, then we start with that one. And the idea was uh, that once they have survived this thing, it's easier to do the rest. You can do it the other way around and for a graduated exposure, but we thought, okay, we, we go with the other way around since we tested it, the graduated exposure, and we started with the, with the weaker one. The problem was, whenever you uh, thought about one, one problem, the next heavier problem appeared into your mind. And then we switched it and said, okay, then we take it. When, if it appears any way, we take it. And the way how we do it, did it is they first said, okay, sign it out. They, they wrote it down. Then they reported it and read it to the, to the therapist. And uh, then if you read it, therapist sees what are, what are they starting, what cognitions, what uh, idea they, do they have. We, so, we said, okay, come on, read it, read it, read it. And what, is the, what idea is coming to your mind? And then they start and say, I'm, I'm wrong, I'm guilty, I've, done, I've deserved that, uh, stuff like that. And it's okay, focus, these are your secondary thoughts, you have to be aware of those, how can we block those? So this is the preparation of all this intrapsychic uh, escape behavior. This is, did, well, we did it for one week or something. Then we started with the exposure. Exposure means in-session exposure, and then they, 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 monitor, they, they taped all the sessions and they had to listen to the uh, sessions every day. The trick is, most of the time we put them on something where I don't know the English word. Uh, it's, an, it's something like a disc with a, a, a half ball be, 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 below it. How do you call it? The f a balance board. Thank you, Melanie. A balance board. We place them on a balance board. Please, Alan. <laughs> I don't have a balance board, but you can imagine Alan's on a balance board. I think he's saying that I'm not working and not to fall over without it. <laughs> so, the point is, if I put him on a balance board, so he starts to, 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 you know, to act like that. Why I'm doing that? The point is, as long as he has troubles with his uh, equilibrium. equilibrium, the brain is focusing on information coming from outside. And the, uh, here, the, this is the ankles, and, and that this is outside for the brain. Yeah? So this is sensory input from the outside. And it's impossible to dissociate as long as you have troubles with your equilibrium. And once he gets used to, and Alan gets very quickly used to, and he stands there, stop it. So he gets used to it and he, he talks. Then I give him balls, tiny little balls he has to catch. <laughs> and once you start to catch balls on a balance board, you cannot dissociate. Yeah? So that's the one thing. Thank you. <laughs> now, let's stay here. What you do in addition is, give me a hand. We, we, we work like this. I know Americans don't touch. But. <laughs> Sorry, we work like this, and this means if I let's say let's play uh, remember some kind of we have you have already read uh, written that tr the trauma and you experience and please go back, and then Alan goes back. So close your eyes. Okay, and now start telling me what happens. How old? Eight. Eight. Um. So, uh, so I'm, I'm walking home from school. Okay. And uh, there are a bunch of boys following me. What? 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 what how are you dressed? Uh, regular school clothes, you know, pants, shirt. What? What color does your shirt have? Uh, blue. I don't know. Maybe blue. No, you know. Look at. Look exactly. Green. Okay. Yeah. What, what do you feel on your skin? Is it warm? Is it cold? Uh, warm. Sweaty. Okay, okay. So keep on. Uh, 
and I realize that they're following me. How do you realize that? Uh, because they're looking at me, and I, they're kind of laughing. Okay, what do you hear exactly? Um, I can't say. I just they're kind of looking at me and laughing. Okay. And they're getting closer. Okay. Um, so I, I, at some point, I realize they're actually following me instead of just going the same way. Okay. What are you feeling right now? Uh, scared. Okay. How do you feel that? How, how do you notice that? Because uh, I have an urge to run. Okay. And uh, also feeling really stupid. Okay. Come on, listen. You feel my hands? Yeah, but I shouldn't have gone this way. I should have taken the, the, okay. the, the, the road instead of cutting through the woods. Okay. Alan, stop, shorty. You feel my hands? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you don't. Press it. Oh, okay. You feel it? Yeah. What do you mention? I'm sorry? What do you feel? Uh, I feel pressure on your hands. Yeah. Okay. They're rough, huh? solid, actually. Okay, good. That's good. No, that's nice. Okay, that's you. Good. this is now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, My hands good. are now. This is no, no, reality. No, that actually helps. Okay. This is now. Yeah. Yeah. Press it. You have power. Okay. 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 Thank you. Go back. Um, okay. So I'm I'm walking faster. Mm -hmm. But they're now they're kind of running mm -hmm. towards me. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'm I'm really scared. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I kind of look back, but I fall down because. Uh, okay. I looked over my shoulder to see what they were doing. And they were all kind of mobbing around me. Mm -hmm. And I'm really scared. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You feel my hand? Yeah, yeah. Press it. This okay. is reality. This is now. Okay. How old are you now? Now? Yeah. Uh, 51. How do, you how do you mention that? Huh? You're grown up, huh? Yeah, yeah. How do you, how do you know that? Uh, I thought about my birth date, and I subtracted. Yeah, okay, this is thinking. What's the difference between there and now? Uh, How do you feel it? Um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not scared here. Yeah, that's a feeling, but give me information. What's the difference? Um, what, what would have been the hand of an eight-year-old boy? Uh, smaller. Okay, press it now. Okay. Got it? Not so small, right? How tall are you? 5'8", uh, five, 5'9". Five, yeah. Look at me. Yeah. You see me? How, yeah. how, how, how big would I be, how tall would I be if you would have been eight years? Uh, Go in this position. You see the difference? So come up. Yeah, that's pretty different. Okay, you see that? Yeah. Okay, fine. I have an eight-year-old. Okay. Okay, keep on. Okay, that's it. Yeah. This, is, this is how we do it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Alan. So this is not a severe trauma, <laughs> uh, but this is more or less exactly how we do. We push them really forward. This is go in the presence, go into their native language, uh, uh, exactly reactivate the smells and anything. And whenever they're really in, we take them out again and say, okay, what's reality? Yeah? And this touching is, I don't know whether it's really necessary. The fact is that everybody says, okay, that's fine for me. Um, the one thing is that you really it's easy to to have him to guide him, yeah. So the patient is not alone, and you really can, whenever he starts drifting away, you simply can press and say, "You feel my hands, yeah." And, and they start, "Okay, okay, there is something." And the second thing I think that's important, no data on that clinical impression is this is the the all this shame related issues. Most of the patients are shamed to death since they think when I report. My therapist has something like a scenery, a picture, the whole scene in his brain, and he sees how awful it is. And the action tendency of shame is hiding, that's clear. What happens is that I have them in my hands, and they feel okay, he doesn't, he's not disgusted, he's not uh, embarrassed or something like that, but he still holds me. There's no talking about that. This is, I think this is a body-related information which is very important to um, correct this, all this shame-related gene. We don't talk about that, yeah? but I think it's very important information, which is so implicit running, maybe. Edna says we have to test it on the scientific way. Edna is right. I really don't know whether all that stuff we're doing is necessary. What is now? This is the power problem. 
Is that what happened yesterday? Yep. Okay. There was something wrong with this. Okay. Okay, and now it's running now. It's good. How, five minutes. So, okay. <laughs> so we've been talking about... Uh -huh. Doesn't matter, we have, any, we have five minutes anyway. So, you look at the... This is the safety data. Um, side effects. You have it on your on your handouts, huh? If you look, every this is every dot is a scatter plot. Every dot, dot is one patient, huh? And this is the relation between uh, the cups at intake and the cups uh, uh, at at uh, discharge. And um, so all those clients who change nothing are within this field of the uh, non-statistical changes, and the red ones are the wait lists. And all those who are up to there, they get worse during the treatment. All those who are here get better during the treatment. You see not one dot in the left wing here. This means not one patient get worse during the treatment. Uh, this means, and here you see about 50% didn't improve. That's, sorry, <laughs> that is the case. But I think this is, if you look de in details at most of the psychiatric treatments, even in, in successful uh, depression treatments, that's how it is. We, we can reach about half of our clients and the other half not. And I don't know who, is, who responds and who not, and we don't have predictors. But this is how the data are. So this, this group really takes benefit, and the, this information is that it doesn't harm at all. The next question is, uh, what's up with um, self-harm? 23 of our subjects were engaged in self-harm before admission. At the first week, this was reduced to seven. This is simply due to the fact that we teach them some skills and so on. And what we said is we, wanted, we don't want to have an increase in self-harm. Whenever self-harm appeared, we gave them a traditional, the, the protocols. They have to have BAs. And, uh, we, and, and, and um, try to, to use skills next time. So we, well, of course, we were very close to that process. And of course, self-harm is an escape behavior, and we don't want to have escape behavior. But that's no reason to not start with, with uh, the prolonged exposure now. So this is what, what the line is. Um, and if you, if you look at the individual subjects, uh, then you see this is the frequency of self-harm behavior during the treatment. Um, that almost anybody really came down within the first week and stayed there. Uh, there's one who took a little bit longer, but came down also. And this is the second group here. So we didn't have an increase in cell farm. So you can say this is due to the nurses and due to contingency manager. They didn't dare or they didn't report. Next thing was urge for cell farm. You can assess the urge for cell farm. And there we say, okay, interesting. It doesn't go down, but it doesn't go up. So urge for cell farm st simply stays during the treatment. And here, here starts exposure all the time. Yeah? So there's no, no increase in, in urge for self-harm. And the same is true for suicidal ideation. So of course they have suicidal ideation. That's what they have all the time. And you, if you wait till it's done, you can wait forever. Uh, so also here, we had no, not one increase in suicidal ideation. No, one. Yeah. OK, that's it. I could now go into details on the, on the treatment, but I think we take uh, two or three minutes for discussion. Uh, what we have, I think, what we could show is that it's a safe and quite effective treatment. Uh, DBT provides everything you need. Uh, if you are uh, targeting PTSD in the severe disabled population, and um, the only I think a limit is that we have only tested it under inpatient conditions, and we have to test it now under outpatient conditions. The advantages that we now know that it's safe, and I'm sure Melanie is exactly reporting the next step or the step she uh, developed in parallel. We do more or less the same, and uh, she's all, she's starting. Uh, she has already started to conduct the data on an outpatient level.
Okay, thank you very much. Questions. Okay. She asked whether we have data on the return in the hospitals. You talking about this treatment or, or um, the usual DBT sta standard DBT treatment? Oh, standard. On standard DBT. The point is, we have an in the average. In Germany, there's an average 60 days a year emergency uh, attrition. No, not attrition, I would say. Uh, admission, yeah? Uh, after this treatment, this comes down to about uh, eight days in the average a year in the, in the following years. So this is quite helpful. Um, but the, the, there are a lot of uh, uh, confounds. The, the point is when you get... an DBT therapist and you have a group and a skills group for, and you can continue the whole treatment, you have a big advantage and if you don't have and you have troubles in your job and your partner you, you have problems with relapses, of course. All the data show that the relapse rate, data rates are quite high. If you look at the last uh, Sanarini study published 2010, she reported things she didn't report at the, very, at the first time. They have, even in the, remission, in the remitted patients, they have let's say they have about 80% remission rates. Remission means two years within 10 years. This doesn't mean stable remission. And in this group, 40% have a relapse. So that means only about 50% have really a sustained non-relapsing remission. These are the data of Mary Sanarini. Uh, and they are not bad. In, huh? You're shaking your head? Oh, sure. <laughs> Uh, and these are the data, we have the same problems in Germany. It strongly depends whether you get a sufficient treatment or not. Yeah? Yeah, the point is, what we looked for, of course, is the borderline severity, the, the, the self-harm, the suicidality. This has no impact. So, this, and we didn't find any uh, predictors till now. I don't know. I simply don't know. Um, maybe it's a special German situation. We have a quite good healthcare system, and uh, we have a lot of patients. Huh? It's different, and we have a lot of patients who are, let's say, they have been traumatized severely, but then they decided uh, to live with this as chronic patients and to go from one clinic to the next clinic to the next clinic. And um, it's a specific yeah, task, challenge, to work with those group and say, okay, uh, what shouldn't change <laughs> and what should change and what's the, what are you afraid of changing and what could happen if we are very successful? So we start now exactly with that question and say, okay, listen, we have good data. And the most complicated thing is that we have very good data. And the most complicated thing is that maybe you are totally healed. And please tell us what shouldn't change at all so that we don't make the mistake and change too much. So, and then they start to think uh, exactly on this uh, chronification process and think, okay, what are the benefits I have? And this is, I think that's the, the number one problem. Uh, the benefits. Listen, they, they are 36 years, so this means a lot of them are 50, and uh, in, the, in their 50s. And just getting a treatment that works after 40 years of suffering is horrible, since they really say, okay, well, I didn't get it that earlier. And uh, it's quite quickly working, so you really can look at that, that it works. And this is a disaster for them on their whole biography. So you, you, you have secondary problems that are more important than the primary problems. But this is a second challenge we have to work with. Yeah?
Yeah, of course. The, the problem is you cannot have, you, you never can look whether, uh, you can no, no, do no causal attrib uh, attribution. You can look at correlations or you look at animal research. There you can have causal experiments. And uh, in animal research clearly says that uh, uh, physical stress, what, what abuse is, and, 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 uh, or separ early separation stress or something like that, has uh, morphological, morphological impacts. You have the... the the HPA axis is different, uh, the prefrontal uh, maturation is different, the hippocampal volume is different, uh, and so on. So, of course, we have troubles with that. But on the other hand, we, are, we thought this, that this would be true for PTSD, and if we, then we did the sibling studies, and we found that uh, the siblings had the same thing as well. So may, we don't know whether in human subjects what, what is the cause and what is the symptom. Uh, yes, we are, we are not sure. Mm -hmm. um, he asked about the, the, the skills training. What we've developed is a self-help CD. Uh, this, is, this means emotion here. Uh, and uh, we, have, we have developed a self-help CD, so, and we give this self-help CD to the clients before they are uh, admitted to the, to the unit. And they, they work with that. So they have all the theoretical stuff of the skills they have already learned. We make tests then and so on. And then we can focus only on what we say, uh, the, the three or four important stress tolerance skills, how to cope with dissociation. And then we focus on emotions. We teach them all about guilt and about sh uh, shame and about uh, self-contempt. So this is the focus, major focus. So that's that, that much. Yeah. No? I, I did, sorry, please repeat. Okay, so what we struggle with when someone does self-injure, even though we do the behavior analysis, yeah. things like that, the, the medical response that there's only responses, and then there's the behavior reinforcement. They mm. go and they give care. And like yeah, but, okay, she's asking how to handle the, the non-intended ne uh, reinforcing of the, of the nurses uh, due to after uh, self-injury. Oh, our nurses are trained. So they are DBT nurses, so everybody knows that uh, any consequence is, 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 has an impact. Oh no, that's quite, they are quite cool. So they have the, 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 they, they need how to taper themselves uh, and there's no, nothing, uh, good attention and stuff like that. So do they do their own care? They do their own care and sometimes if they have to go to surgery then two of them go. Uh, so the, the point is, uh, this, this is the standard uh, inpatient DBT protocol. This once you have cut yourself, you have a timeout of two hours, you go into your room and you write your BA and then you take all your peers and you report your BA to the peers and you discuss what could be done next and uh, how to repair all that stuff. So this is an ongoing protocol that's standardized. So um, for that it's quite clear they don't like it and there's no, uh, at least not much. Um, non-intended reinforcement. Yeah. Charlie Swenson has developed that. <laughs> this was not me. Huh? Time. Yeah, it's time for Melanie. Thank you. Afternoon.